how Jacob, he lamed him. Before Peter preached Pentecost, Peter was made lame on the threshing floor. For Jesus said, Peter, tonight Satan has asked excessively that he might sift you like grain. And that sifting caused all pride in Peter to be removed in order that Peter would know the only thing good in him is the Lord Jesus Christ. God. And that is where you have been as the bride of Christ Jesus. And we're going to start in this revelation. We're going to enter Ruth shortly. But before we enter Ruth, we've got to start at Luke 14 because many are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen. In verse 12, let's look. Luke 14, verse 12, Jesus also said to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your wealthy neighbors, lest perhaps they invite you in return and you are paid back. But when you give a banquet or a reception, invite the poor, the disabled, the lame, and the blind. Then you will be blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied because they have no way of repaying you. And you will be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, A man was once giving a great supper, invited many, and at the hour for the supper he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for all is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses and to beg off. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I have to go out and see it. I beg you, have me excused. And another one said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to examine, put my approval on them. And I beg you, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and because of this, I'm unable to come. So the servant came, reported these answers to his master. Then the master of the house said in wrath. So do you think there's a little anger here? Yes. He said in wrath to his servant, Go quickly. Go quickly into the great streets and the small streets of the city. Bring in here the poor the disabled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant returning said, Sir, what you have commanded to me to do has been done, and yet there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and urge and constrain them to yield and come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those who were invited shall taste of my supper. Now huge crowds were going along with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, does not hate his own father and mother in the sense of indifference to our relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God, and likewise his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not persevere and carry his own cross Come after me, follow me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, wishing to build a farm building, does not first sit down and calculate the cost? 
to see whether he has sufficient means to finish it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is unable to complete the building, all who see it will begin to mock and jeer at him, saying, This man began to build and was not able worth enough to finish. Or what king going out to engage in conflict with another king will not for sit down and consider, take counsel, whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if he cannot do so, when the other king is still a great way off, he sends an envoy and asks the terms of peace. So then... Any of you who does not forsake, renounce, surrender, claim to give up, say goodbye to all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Salt is good and excellent thing, but if salt has lost its strength and has become saltless and sipid flat, how shall its saltness be restored? It is fit neither for the land nor for the manure heap. Men throw it away. He who has ears to hear, let him listen and consider, comprehend by the hearing. So here we see Jesus give a revelation to the disciples. And the distinction is, if you have a dinner, don't invite those who can pay you back. But instead, invite the blind, the disabled, and the lame, for they cannot pay you back. And then after he makes that distinction, immediately he goes into another parable. And the parable is this. There were some invited to a great supper. That word invited in Greek comes from the root word that means called. They were called to the supper. But Jesus said to them, not one who was called will taste this supper. See, many are called, but few are chosen. The chosen ones are the blind, the lame, and the disabled because they cannot ever pay Jesus Christ back for the redemption purchase of his blood. This is where God brought Peter through Jesus. The sifting you're in is to make you aware of how utterly lame you are. Glory to God. So guess what God does in Ruth? He uses the lamest person that could be picked out, which is a Moabitess woman. I know how Ruth feels because in ministry, many people want to put Robin in the corner and lift my husband forward. I go through this. I know how Ruth feels. See, I am the most awkward person, the last person God could use because God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. But he does it in order that one thing can happen. I will utterly know that I am, I am absolutely lame. I am the last person God would ever use to preach the gospel of Christ Jesus. That is why I'm utterly dependent upon Him because it's not by my power, it's not by my might, but it is by His Spirit that He teaches his word. So are you ready for the revelation of Ruth? Ruth 1. In the days, verse 1, Ruth 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem of Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, the man's name was Elimelech. And his wife's name was Naomi, and his two sons were named Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went to the country of Moab and continued there. 
But Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with two sons. And they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. So the woman was bereft of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she left the place where she was, her two daughters-in-law, with her, and they started on the way back to Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead with me. The Lord grant you that you may find a home and rest, each in the house of her husband, then she kissed them and wept aloud. Go to verse 14. Then they wept aloud again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. And Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Urge me not to leave you or to turn back from following you, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything, but death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said, no more. Now let's get a revelation of this. Are you ready? This is what God was showing me. Ruth married Elimelech, right? And Elimelech passes away. And as Elimelech passes away, what baby? Oh, sorry. My husband's saying, Naomi. Thank you, baby. As when Naomi married Elimelech, right, Elimelech passes away. And when Elimelech passes away, she's left with her two sons and her daughter-in-law, right? Now, Elimelech means God of the king. God of the king. It also means to induct to royalty. It means also to set up by making a queen, reigning, rule, to be counsel. So here with Naomi, Elimelech dies, where we are made a royal priesthood in God Almighty through Christ Jesus. We see here that while Naomi is in Moab, Elimelech dies. And then her two sons die, and Ruth goes with her, but Orpah stays. Now, Orpah means mane of the neck. It also means to be stiff-necked, or can we say pride? Because when God gets ready to bring you through this threshing, He's going to expose all pride in our soul that would war against His plans and His purposes. So here, God causes Orpah to stay in Moab. But it's something that's happened to Naomi, two things. There's been a death, a grief, but it's also caused her to move back to Bethlehem of Judah, to the house of bread, to the praise of God. And here, Ruth clings to her. Ruth in Hebrew means friend. But Naomi means pleasantness, and it even refers to grace. So look at it at this respect. Ruth clings to grace because she's about to go over into the promises of God, but she's been in a place where she's an outcast, she's downtrodden, she's the last person to be considered to be in the lineage of Christ Jesus. 
But remember, God uses the foolish things, the despised things to confound the wise. So here she is, and she's having to leave because the land that she was in was cut off. But this is the thing I didn't tell you. Her two sons, Milan and Chilion, Milan means invalid, lame. Ruth was married to lame. Ruth was married to invalid because you're going to get a revelation. It is when we go through the threshing that we are broken and we are made utterly lame that we know it is only God Almighty that can do anything. See, I'm standing before you today, but I didn't want to be a preacher. I have a master's in social work, a bachelor's in social work. I've got a law degree. I thought I was going to be an attorney, but God surprised me. He brought me out of the world, and he said, Robin, I've anointed you. You've been despised. You've been looked down on. But daughter, you are lame, and I'm carrying you to my table. Well, I will utterly display the glory of my truth in your life. This is where we are. God uses the lame. Let's get a revelation of this further. We see in chapter 2 and verse 1 where they go over into Bethlehem of Judah. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain. After him in whose sight I shall find favor. Naomi said to her, Go, my daughter. And Ruth went and gleaned in the field and the reapers, and she happened to stop at the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servants, who was set over the reapers, Whose maiden is this? And the servant said over the reapers, answered, She's a Moabitish girl who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather here after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from early morning until now except when she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, do not go glean from another field or leave this one, but stay here close to my maidens. Verse 10, Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should notice me when I am a foreigner? And Boaz said to her, I have been made fully aware of all you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people unknown to you before you. The Lord recompense you for what you've done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. So here she is and she's gleaning from a field that is not her own. But he is a kinsman who has the right of redemption. And the thing that called Boaz's attention was all that she had done for her mother-in-law, for Naomi. So get a revelation of this. All that Ruth had done to clung to grace. 
It is not by my power. It is not by my might. But it is by your spirit, by your grace, God, that anything gets done. This is the process in which we are being in, in the threshing. We are clinging to grace. We don't think we can make it. It's hard, but grace keeps us on the threshing floor where we do not give up. See, I don't want to do this right now. I don't want to preach. He keeps encouraging me to preach. If it was up to me, I would go back home, sit in my little house, and be to myself. But grace through my husband keeps telling me, Robin, God's anointed you to preach the gospel so that souls can come in to the kingdom. I am utterly lame. I don't want to do this. I'm chosen because I'm lame and it's God in me that preaches the gospel. This is where Jacob had to get before he could walk in the call with the power of God Almighty. He had to have a wrestling with God where he would have a limp. And from that point forward, Jacob would utterly limp. He would be lame for the rest of his life. Listen, when we go through the threshing, and it's like one threshing after another threshing after another threshing, the whole point is to keep you utterly lame to where you know you can't do it. See, I know I can't preach the gospel. And God keeps allowing me to be threshed over and over and over to where I completely do not want to do it. The only reason I do it is because I obey. Do you see what God's bringing here? That you cling to grace in order to walk in the call. Because the moment you stop clinging to grace, then you'll start making excuses. Oh, I can do it this way. I can do it that way. But then we've got man's flesh working and God's anointing is blocked up and is not allowed to move. This is a demonstration of Ruth where we've got to stay in a place where she was married to invalid. She was married to lame. And what is so incredible, the revelation is, is that Boaz redeems her in order to get the inheritance for lame. Do you see? In order to get the inheritance for the dead man. And whose name is invalid. His name is lame. The minute we forget that we're married to lame is the minute we start backsliding, is the minute we stop clinging to grace. That is the revelation of this word. But let's go further. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, shall I not seek rest? Are a home for you that you may prosper. And now it is not Boaz with whose maidens you were a relative. See his winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Hello, at the threshing floor. Promotion comes after you go to the threshing floor and he gets ready to exalt those that are humbled. See, before in Luke 14, before I got into the wedding supper or into the supper and who to invite, Scripture says that Jesus exalts those that are humbled and those that are humbled are the ones that he exalts. That's what being lame does, is it keeps you forever humble. The minute I forget how utterly lame I am is the minute I stop 
denying the grace of God. Amazing grace. Oh, how sweet. The minute we forget the power of grace is the minute we start walking in the flesh. So let's see further about the kinsman redeemer. Wash and anoint, verse 3, chapter 3. Wash and anoint yourself, therefore put on your best clothes, go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, notice the place where he lies, then go uncover his feet and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. And Ruth said to her, All that you say to me I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had told her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk with his heart, was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then Ruth came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. At midnight the man was startled, and he turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your wing of protection over your maidservant, for you are the next of kin. And he said, Blessed be you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have made this former, you have made this last loving kindness greater than the former. For you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich, and now, my daughter, fear not, I will do for you all you require. For all my people in the city know you are a woman of strength, worth, bravery, capability. It is true, I am your near kinsman. However, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will perform to you the part of a kinsman, good. Let him do it. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman for you, then as the Lord lives, I will do the part of a kinsman for you. Lie down until morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. For he said, Let it be not known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Also he said, Bring me the mantle you're wearing and hold it. So Ruth held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into town. So here we see that her mother tells her to go meet Boaz at the threshing floor. It is there that he will notice her. It is there that he will lift her up. Right now, you are, some of you are at a threshing floor moment. You're no different from Ruth. You're in a place where Boaz, where God, Jesus Christ, is about to lift you up and he's about to make a public display of his power, of his truth, of his promises in your life. Here, he gives Ruth a mantle. He says, I will take care of this tomorrow. We have to see if the first kinsman will redeem it. If he does not, then we have to go to the other kinsman. Then I will redeem it, says Boaz. But this is the thing. He tells her to take her mantle. And in it he gives her six measures of barley. Six is the number for the rod. It's the number of man. It is the creation of Elohim, the goodness of God in us. So here he gives her six measures of barley. And it indicates the barley harvest, which is at the time of Passover. The blood of Jesus. Amazing grace. The throne of grace where mercy comes out. It is an indicator that she has obtained mercy and she walks not in a false 
mercy, but she walks in a true mercy where she's appropriated the fullness of what her lover would give to her. This threshing floor experience is in order to cause you. Many are called, but few are chosen. The lame are the chosen. That's what we're going to see as we end in Ruth 4. Ruth 4 verse 1, Then Boaz went up to the city's gate, sat down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz had spoken came by. He said to him, Ho, turn aside, sit down here. So he turned aside, sat down, and Boaz took ten men. Ten means a testimony. Hallelujah. So we're getting a testimony. Ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. And they sat down. And he said to the kinsmen, Naomi, who has returned from the country of Moab, has sold the parcel of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to let you hear of it, saying, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, then do it. But if you will not redeem it, then say so that I may know. For there is no one besides you to redeem it. And I am the next of kin after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field of Naomi, you must buy also Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the dead man, to restore the name of the dead to his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I can't redeem it for myself, lest by marrying a Moabitess I endanger my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Can we say they did not want to look bad? The first kinsman redeemer, when he found out that if he, if he redeemed Naomi's land of Elimelech, he would have to get Ruth the Moabitess. He said, that cannot happen. That will tarnish my reputation. I can't get my inheritance. See, when you are the lame, people look at you and they know God cannot use you in their own mindset where they still have not obtained mercy, where they still have not obtained grace. Because true grace says that God uses the lame. He uses the foolish. He uses the despised things to confound the wise. That's where Ruth is. She's at a place where Boaz said he will redeem her. And so Boaz makes redemption. Verse 6, verse 7. Now formerly in Israel, this was the custom concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. A man pulled off his sandal, gave it to the other. This was the way of attesting in Israel. Therefore, when the kinsman said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he pulled off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders, to all the people, you are the witnesses this day. I've bought all this day that I've bought Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Also Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have bought to my wife to restore the name of the dead to his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from the brethren and from the gate of his birthplace. You are witnesses this day. Do you look and expect for breakthrough? Have you been on the threshing floor that something within you by the power of Holy Spirit says this is the time for breakthrough? Where you've been at a low place in order to know how utterly lame you are that the only one that can
and breakthrough for you is God Almighty. And this is where Ruth is, verse 11. And all the people at the gate and the elders said, We are the witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who's coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the household of Israel, may you do worthily, get wealth, power, and Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. Ephrata means fruitful. Bethlehem, the house of bread. May you be fruitful in the word of God's promises that says you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. Verse 12, and let your house be like the house of Perez. Breakthrough. Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. See here, another despised one, Tamar, someone who had Perez and Zarar by her father-in-law, Judah. She was brought to the stake to be burned by her father-in-law to make a public display of how foolish, how despised she would be. But once she gave him the staff and the signet ring and gave him that the cord, he said, you have been more righteous than I. And then we saw the double portion anointing of God upon Tamar, who was the most despised and the most foolish thing that could be considered in the lineage of Christ Jesus. Now her and both Ruth are in the lineage of Christ Jesus. And the most incredible thing is, as in Matthew 1, 3, Tamar's name her actual name is mentioned as one of the very few women in the lineage of Christ Jesus. God gave Tamar honor for what people would consider foolish, what people would consider despised. Tamar knew she was lame. And here the blessing is upon Ruth. And the blessing is that she would have a bountiful fruitfulness, that she would break through, that she would be in the lineage of Christ Jesus. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Verse 14. And the woman, women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close kinsman. May his name be famous in Israel. May he be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher, supporter in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her bosom, and he, she became the nurse. And her neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son is born to Naomi. That They named him Obed. Obed means servant. So we see the lineage of Christ Jesus starting for, from Perez in verse 18. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez, meaning breaker, was the father of Hezron. Hezron means to be enclosed, as in a courtyard. We are fenced in. We are under the wing of God. He is our covering. We see that Hezron is the father of Ram. Ram means high, to raise up. God exalts the humble. Ram is the father of Aminadab. Aminadab means people of liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. We see Aminadab is the father of Nishan. Now get this breaker anointing that God's giving revelation on. Nishan means enchanter. It means to uh, 
put upon a magic spell? Or can we say that the enemy lies to us even today? But God has an anointing to destroy the yoke that would hold you captive. See me, it is a difficulty. People don't understand the wrestling I go through with God. I feel the last person called. I feel the last person to preach. And I wrestle with God saying, God, I don't want to go preach. I want to leave. I want to throw up. I just want to go home. But God wrestles me and he says, No, Robin, I've called you. I'm lifting off that lying serpent that says you can't preach, that says you aren't called. I'm lifting it off in order that you will not be under the spell of the lie, but the breaking anointing of my word will lift you up when you're on that threshing floor. It will exalt the power of Christ Jesus in you because it's not by your power. It is not by your might, but it is by His Spirit. I am thankful for a husband I can respect and I can honor and I'm thankful he's my covering and I'm thankful that I submit to him and because I submit to him, I'm out here preaching to you. If I could submit to Robin, I wouldn't be out here. But that is what obedience to God, to his covering does, is it breaks that spell off of you that would put you in a corner, that would restrain the word, restrain the authority of Christ Jesus. It breaks it and destroys that yoke. Now let's look at the last names. Neshon is the father of Salmon. Salmon means a garment, a garment. Salmon is the father of Boaz. Boaz means swiftly, quickly. God is bringing the breakthrough anointing where the word breaks through forth to open the gates swiftly. Salmon is the father of Boaz, Boaz of Obed's servant, Obed of Jesse, which means to stand out, and Jesse of David, beloved. So God stands out, his beloved. Now we're going to end here with Micah 4, verse 6 and 7. Micah 4, verse 6 and 7. So you can know how lame you are, and you want to be lame, hallelujah. You don't want, you don't not want, want to be lame. You want to be lame. Hallelujah. Micah 4, verse 6. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. Woo! I will assemble the lame. And I will gather those who've been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And I will make the lame a remnant that those who were cast off a strong nation and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and you, O tower of the flock, the hill, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto you the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Verse 11, Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, let her be profaned. Let our eyes gaze upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord. Neither do they understand his plan. For he shall gather them like the sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. For I will make your horn iron. And I will make your hooves bronze and you shall be in pieces many peoples and I will devote their gain to the Lord and their treasure to the Lord of all the earth do you feel you are lame have you forgotten how lame you are see when I keep in remembrance that it is not one thing good in me. 
that I know without Jesus I'm a leper, that I know without mercy I'm utterly lost. When I keep in remembrance I'm utterly lame, <clears throat> when I can't even walk to the table, but my master, my savior carries me to the table. That keeps me in remembrance how lame I am. Many are called. Few are chosen. Ruth denied everything. She left everything to follow God. She knew how lame she was that she fell on her face in complete awe and grace of the redemption that came forth. We can never leave this place. We have to stay utterly lame. And that's what we see in the parable. The ones invited, the ones called, what did they do? Make excuses. But the lame came. So, Father God, I ask you anywhere, God, in any of us, where there is pride, where there is stiff-necked, God, anything that is contrary to your plans, God. For we know not the plans you have, God, but you know the thoughts and the plans you have for us. So, God, I ask you to pour out your spirit of understanding in order that you would cause us to have discernment, to be able to be discreet in this hour, in order that we would not rise above the anointing of your Holy Spirit, in order that we would not rise above the power of your truth, God, but God, that you would bring in the Hebrews 4.12 sword of the Spirit, and you would pierce our hearts to divide between motives and intentions, God, between the soul and the spirit, and that which is not of you, God, that which would interfere, which would be a hindrance in coming against us being able to see that we are utterly lame. God, anything that would hinder that, God, I ask you, to remove it out of us by the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to remove that which would be a hindrance to God Almighty, to his plans. God, anything, even a false humility. God, remove that out of our soul. Remove it out of us, God, in the name of Jesus, in order that we would be like Ruth. We would run to the throne of grace boldly to obtain mercy in the name of Jesus. Amen. For anyone who would like ministry, I pray a lot of the word and I'm...